welcome to the Slick Rides Garage Express. Today on the Slick Rides Garage Express, I'm disassembling the front suspension of this 1988 GMC R-Series one-ton flatbed truck. I'll be replacing the lower and upper control arms along with all new brake components, wheel bearings, and seal, plus installing a new shock absorber and pitman arm. From start to finish, the job took me 12 hours. I'm going to show you the whole job in just 18 minutes. Welcome aboard and enjoy the demonstration. First, I'll detach the brake hose from the hard line. Blowing the fitting off helps keep debris out of the hydraulic system and penetrating oil helps things come apart easier. I'm using a flare nut wrench when detaching the hard line so the nut is not damaged. Next, I'll remove the brake hose retaining nut then push the hose fitting through the frame. Now I'll wire brush the brake hose bracket retaining nut then detach it from the upper control arm. This is not a blind fastener and must be held with a wrench from behind. Once the nut and bolt are removed, I'll lift the bracket and hose straight up to free the mounting pad. Here's a tip I use. The brake hose bracket mounting tab blocks access to the brake hose bracket bolt from underneath the control arm. A box end wrench won't fit between the head of the bolt and tab, so I'll use an open end wrench from the outboard side of the control arm to hold the bolt and remove the nut. The brake caliper is next. Once the retaining bolt is removed, the clip and spring can be tapped out. Prying through the inspection window against the brake rotor compresses the piston for brake pad clearance. This piston is stuck so I'll tap it off with a hammer and then remove the caliper with the brake hose. Now the wheel bearings can be checked. Both bearings are obviously bad and will be replaced. This hole in the hub gives me access to remove the bearing dust cap. I'll insert a flat blade screwdriver into the hole just under the lip of the dust cover here. I'll tap the screwdriver lightly to seat the blade under the lip, then turn the handle which pries the dust cover back. Now I'll reinsert the screwdriver and pop off the dust cover. Now I have access to the spindle nut. I'll remove the cotter pin, discard it, then remove the nut. I find the washer and outer bearing are easiest to remove by striking the brake rotor with the palm of my hand. Watch how the washer and bearing just pops out. Here's another look in super slow motion. Now the hub and brake rotor slide right off. After removing the brake dust shield, I'm checking to make sure the base seal is present. It keeps debris and moisture out of the inner wheel bearing and seal. Now I'll detach the tie rod from the steering knuckle. The cover pin was stuck, so I used my pick through the eye and pried it back slightly. Now, I can pinch the cutter pin with my wire cutters and pry it out using the steering knuckle as a fulcrum point. The castle nut can now be removed, but I'll reinstall it to protect the threads during the next step. I'll strike the steering knuckle here with my 3 pound hammer to dislodge the pie rod ball stud from the steering knuckle. It doesn't necessarily take a hard strike to achieve this. When the ball stud pops free, I'll remove the castle nut and detach the tie rod. Now the steering knuckle turns freely. I'll use this to my advantage later, but first I'll detach the shock absorber at the lower control arm and push it up out of the way. Next I'll move to the forward side of the lower control arm and detach the sway bar. After removing the counter pins, I'll loosen the upper and lower ball joint nuts. I'm turning the knuckle in the direction I'm turning the nut. Eventually it stops turning, so I don't have to hold it while breaking the nuts loose. Using my 3 pound hammer, I'll strike the steering knuckle here to dislodge the ball stud, like I did on the tie rod. The nuts are loosely installed to protect the threads from an unintended hammer strike. Working quickly and calmly here will minimize my time spent in the danger zone. I'll use a pry bar on the upward facing lower ball joint to make sure it's dislodged. Now, I'll remove the castle nuts, then lift the upper control arm to free the upper ball joint. Now the steering knuckle lifts right off. With the truck properly supported, I'll decompress the coil spring. Have you noticed the position of my floor jack? There is an important reason. If you will look closely at the jack right here, you will see it's moving backwards with the swing of the control arm. If the jack cannot move with this motion, the jack could tip over and the spring loses its support from underneath. When this happens, the spring is forcefully ejected from the upper spring pocket and will become a 20-pound missile 
moving at initial speeds up to 100 feet per second. Are you wondering why I'm not using a spring compressor? Decompressing a coil spring is dangerous and accidents can happen regardless of method used. Either way, the spring must be decompressed to be made safe. I'd rather do this from three feet away, lying under the truck for protection, as opposed to standing right next to the spring while releasing the compressor where there is no protection. Now I'll remove the upper control arm. After wire brushing the mounting nuts and threads, I'll back the nuts off of it with the impact so the alignment shims stay in place. These are location specific and must be reinstalled in the same place. I'll use two different color plastic zip ties around each stack to identify their position. Once the mounting nuts are removed, the control arm slides right off. Next, I'm removing the pitman arm starting at the drag link. I'll loosen the nut, then use a pickle fork to separate it from the pitman arm. Leaving the nut on keeps the drag link from falling after separation. The pitman nut is next. Wire brushing the nut and stub shaft threads makes for easy removal. With the nut removed, I'll attach my pitman arm puller and run the press bolt down with the impact until it barely turns. Now I'll use my air hammer on the side of the pitman arm to help break it free from the stub shaft. Another quick zip of the impact gun on the press bolt and the pitman arm comes right off. Finally, I'll remove the lower control arm. I'll detach the U-bolts at the control arm shaft, give it a few whacks with a hammer, and front suspension disassembly is complete. After a bath in the hot tank, I'm inspecting and reconditioning each item as needed, starting with the steering knuckle. The brake caliper mounts are rusty, so I'm using my wire brush on a drill to clean them to bare metal. I'm taking my time here because this needs to be right. The brake caliper must be able to slide on its mounts, or the outboard brake pad will not apply. This will lead to reduced braking ability, aggressive wear on the inboard brake pad and rotor along with temperatures higher than the service limit of these components, which will ruin them. Also, both notches in the knuckle where the inboard brake pad installs must also be cleaned. The inboard pad must be able to slide freely in these notches to ensure it applies and releases evenly. I'm also wire brushing the spindle from the base seal surface up to and including the spindle nut threads. Lastly, I'll check these services by hand to ensure no burrs or defects are present that might ruin the new parts or hinder reassembly. Next, I'll clean the base seal surface on the brake dust shield. The seal sits on the flange at the base of the spindle. If the seal is not present, the wheel seal and inner bearing can become contaminated, which will ruin them. Now I'll set the shield on the knuckle, give it a twist to make sure the seal is seated, start the bolts by hand, and tighten them down with the impact. Now I'll prep the hub and rotor. A fast check reveals this flange on the dust shield will contact the wheel speed sensor tone ring. If not removed, the hub and rotor will not seat on the spindle. This truck is not equipped with anti-lock brakes, so I'm using my slide hammer to remove it. It's pressed on, it comes off easily with only a few whacks. The hub and rotor prep continues with a spray down of both friction surfaces using brake parts cleaner. I'll blow them off with compressed air, then wipe out the inner bearing seat thoroughly to ensure debris is absent when I install the inner wheel bearing after packing it with grease. This is the next step. I'm placing the grease in the palm of one hand, then pressing the bearing into the grease with the other. The grease is packed into the area between the inner race and the roller cage here. Ideally, when packing is complete, this area will be full of grease and all voids will be filled. I know this is beginning to happen when I see grease protruding from the opposite side of the bearing like you see here. When the bearing is fully packed, I'll put a thin layer of grease on the inner race as well as the outside of the rollers and set the bearing in the hub. Next I'll install the wheel seal. I'll start by pressing it into the bore by hand, then I'll use the tried and true block of wood method to drive it into the hub. I'll lift the block a few times to make sure the seal is driving straight. Once the seal is in, I'll make sure it's flush with the surrounding flange. Now I'll set the hub and rotor on the spindle after lightly greasing the seal lip and flange. I'm not concerned about the inner bearing falling out since it is now captured by the wheel seal. After giving the hub a little wiggle, it drops into place. Spinning the hub and rotor helps begin seating the inner bearing. I already packed the outer wheel bearing and set it in the hub. 
I'll start the spindle nut by hand, then snug it with a ratchet and socket. I'll turn the hub and rotor to start fully seating the bearings, then I'll final tighten the spindle nut. The notches in the castle nut must line up with the hole for the cotter pin in the spindle as well as this hole in the hub. Once things are lined up and the cotter pin is started, I'll pull it through with my wire cutters, bend the cotter pin over, and cut off any excess. This flange on the dust cover is also used to install it. Using a flat blade screwdriver on the flange and one finger on top of the dust cover will keep it from popping out when I start tapping it in with my hammer. After it starts, I'll lift my finger and tap it in until it fully seats into the hub. Now the inboard brake pad can be installed into the steering knuckle. I've installed the guide clips to the ears of the pad. The clips have a tang here that acts like a spring to fully release the pad after braking. I installed the pad into the steering knuckle and checked it to make sure it slides freely. The outboard brake pad installs next. I'm placing these tabs into the notches on the brake caliper and verifying proper placement. These tabs and notches along with the brake rotor keep the outer pads in place. There are no clips or strings required. While holding the outboard pad in place, I'll slip the brake caliper up into the top mount on the steering knuckle and then seat it onto the lower mount. Now, I'll slide the retainer and spring in between the caliper and lower mount, then tap it in with a hammer. The notch in the retaining clip aligns with the shoulder of this bolt and is then tightened with specification. Brake caliper installation ends by checking to make sure the caliper slides freely on its mount. Now I'll inspect the new lower control arm. I'm making sure all accessories are present and checking the alignment holes for burrs or defects. Lastly, I'll make sure the shock fits properly into the mount. Next I'll install the upper shock bolt. After checking to make sure all accessories are present, I'll slip the bolt into the shock, install the washer, and snug the nut. Placing these flat spots at the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position will ensure the wrench fits when the shock is bolted to the truck. I'll hold the bolt in place with the wrench and torque the nut. I'll keep track of the remaining fasteners by installing them loosely into the shock. The last item to be prepped for installation is the upper control arm. With all accessories present, I'll install a brake hose by sliding the tab on the bracket into the notch in the bolt hole. The bolt installs from behind and the nut goes on the hose bracket. I'm remembering to access the head of the bolt from the outboard side of the control arm with an open end wrench so I can tighten the nut. Before installing the upper control arm, I'm cleaning where it mounts to the truck. I removed about a pound of dirt and grease from the top of the spring pocket. Now, I'll wire brush everything clean to bare metal to ensure proper placement and less time at the alignment shop. The dome washer is installed first, then I'll slide on the control arm. I'll install the nuts by hand, slide the control arm in, then install my clean alignment shims between the dome washers and the truck's frame. Once they're set in, I'll push in on the control arm to keep the shims in place, snug the nuts with my impact, then torque the nuts by hand to specification. Installing the grease surge blast keeps them from getting damaged or broken off during control arm installation. Remember these holes in the lower control arm shaft? These pins on the truck's frame must engage these holes to ensure proper placement. I'm using my wire brush at multiple angles to clean these pins and seats for a nice clean installation. Now I'll install the new pitman arm. Once the spline and wide notch align with those on the stub shaft, it will slide right on. I'll tighten the pitman nut hand tight, then slide the drag link onto the ball stud and tighten the nut hand tight. After torquing both nuts, I'll install a new cotter pin. Pitman arm installation is finished by installing the greaser. Installing the lower control arm is made easier with the assistance of my floor jack. I centered the jack pad on the control arm shaft, then raised the jack and control arm just barely enough to hold it in place. This motion allows me to feel the locating pins moving slightly in the mounting holes and tells me they're engaged, so I'll install the mounting new bolts tighten them to specification, then install the shock absorber to the frame. See the angle of the wrench? Having the bolt in the proper orientation made for a super quick install.
Now it's time to reinstall the coil spring. With the jack properly placed, I'll raise the control arm with the jack of it and slip the spring in. Both the bottom and top of the spring seat into keyed mounts. I'll use a pry bar to help the bottom of the spring into its seat. Check the spring placement again, then raise the control arm until just before the spring begins to compress. With a final good check for proper spring placement, I'll remove the castle nuts from the ball joints and lower the shock absorber to a position it can be quickly engaged into its mount. To demonstrate how far the jack moves and the importance of proper jack placement, I mark the jack and wheel here. As the jack is raised, it creeps forward with the swing of the lower control arm or a direction the jack is intended to move. This jack is not designed to move laterally. It is lateral motion that can cause the jack to be tipped over, resulting in the spring being forcefully ejected from the upper spring pocket. The consequences of this are property damage, injury, or death to anyone or anything within a 100 feet radius of the danger zone. As I continue to raise the lower control arm with the jack, I'm not surprised when the spring final seats into the lower control arm with a hefty pop. I'll continue to raise the lower control arm with the jack until the full weight of the truck is on the jack and the frame is just off the support box. Working quickly and calmly, I'll get the lower shock into the control arm, slide the bolt in place, then place the steering knuckle assembly onto the lower ball joint. Quickly hand thread the nut on, then repeat through the upper ball joint. Once the castle nuts are on, I'm free of the immediate danger and suspension reassembly can continue. After checking the bushing, I'll reinstall the sway bar. Now, I'll torque both ball joints and install new cotter pins. I waited until the upper ball joint was torqued to install the brake hose to the caliper. The copper ceiling washers are new and should never be reused. With the washers properly placed, I'll install the hose and tighten the banjo bolt to specification. Now I'll reinstall the tie rod. After torquing it to specification, I'm installing a new cotter pin. Once the grease zerts are installed, suspension reassembly is complete. Before installing the wheel, I'll bleed the brake hydraulic system, then use appropriate grease to lubricate anywhere a grease zert is present. The last step is always quality control. I'm going over all points of disassembly to ensure everything is installed properly. Before reinstalling the wheel, I'm using my wire brush on the hub and flange to remove all dirt, rust, and corrosion. This helps ensure the wheel will seat properly onto the new components. After the wheels go on, there is still post-service care. The truck needs a front-end alignment immediately after service. I'll recheck the lug nut torque at 250 miles, and at 500 miles, I'll check everything over one more time. Looks like another solid repair by Slick Rides Garage. Thanks for watching.